May Christ's light of the world enlighten our hearts with love. Baptist, United Methodist, United Church of Christ, and a whole lot more. We're glad that you've joined us this Sunday for wherever you are, whoever you are on life's journey. We know this is a time that is filled with a lot of anxiety, uncertainty, fear, but we are here to kind of clear all that away today, for a moment at least, and to remember that God calls us into worship, into centering ourselves into being in right relationship with God and one another. So I invite you in this moment that we're just going to check in with our hearts, with our souls, and be together in this creative space. Whether you're joining right in the moment all together here and participating in the chat, or whether you're watching later in the day or the week. I want to encourage you to participate in the chat when we pass the peace, when we offer prayers and greeting one another. Remember that it's a public forum for the world to see. I also want to encourage you, uh, to, if you're a first-time viewer with us, to sign up with our virtual visitor card, which is on the YouTube page. Also, uh, if you come regularly and you like what we do here, feel free to like and subscribe. That helps us spread the word about United Parish and let, let other people know we're here. There's also a virtual way that you can participate in the offering and help support our ministries here. I'm glad to be back with you after three Sundays off of vacation. Our associate pastor, Amy Norton, is away today for some more R&R, &R, which is well-deserved. But as you'll see, our church year is ramping up, even in these unusual times, with church school registration and some other offerings, which we'll tell you about later in the worship, or you can check in your weekly email. For now, I just want to say it's good to be with you. It's good to have you here. May God bless us all in this time together, and may we listen for God's still speaking voice in our prayers, in our music, in our silence, and in our speaking. Come, let us worship together.
We believe in a God who's always trying to work with us to bring out the very best in who we are in all places, in all times, in all situations. A God who loves us fully and completely, knows the very best about us and the very worst. Just like the waters splashing against the shore, God wants to remind us of abundant love and goodness, infinite kind of love and forgiveness. And so we think about this past week, how we lived our lives, the good things that happened, the difficult things that happened, the things that enhanced the goodness and the God qualities in our humanity, and the things that got us out of sync with God. So I just invite you to take a moment to think about your past week, how God, how you allowed God to work with you, and the times when maybe God could have worked with you a little bit more. Just take a moment, maybe put a hand on your heart, or feel your pulse, and remember that you are a beloved child of God. Let us pray together. Loving and compassionate God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in one another, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We turn away from the harm that enslaves us, the harm we have done, and the harm done on our behalf. Forgive us, restore and strengthen us, we pray. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. For all the prayers we say aloud and for those heard only in our hearts. Oh God, in your compassion, hear our prayer. I invite you to rise in body and spirit wherever you are. To remember that God loves you just the way you are and loves you too much to let you stay that way. Together we recommit ourselves to God's values as we launch into the week ahead. Remembering that God has made us in God's own image. That we are beautiful and wonderful and worthy of praise and love. And to go on and to praise and love others and help them know the abundance of life. If you believe in this kind of abundance, this kind of forgiveness a little bit, or if you believe it with your whole soul, I invite you to say amen. Confident in God's love, God's forgiveness. We're invited to share that love and forgiveness wherever we go, and we do so starting right now with a holy greeting. The peace of Christ and the love of God be with you always. This little light of mine going on the mission. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine going on the mission. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, going on the mission.
under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Today we hear a familiar and cherished passage from the Gospel of Matthew. As Jesus prepares his followers for the end times and how they should live their lives now, we offer the full passage this morning in which Matthew's version emphasizes some of the harsh consequences. Let us open our ears, our minds, our imaginations, our hearts and souls as we listen across time and space for the good news of Jesus's ministry. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those that are at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you as sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. I was naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. For the good news of Jesus Christ, thanks be to God. We continue once again this morning with our Adventures in Faith series, hearing about how different people experience the adventure of a life of faith. I'm Glad to welcome this morning someone who's very important in my life. Uh, many of you know I grew up in Independence, Missouri. I grew up in a loving family, a loving church community, which is very much like how United Parish is. Also, I grew up in good schools and a loving extended family of people. I also grew up encouraged to think creatively and to ask questions and to sometimes think beyond the assumptions. And I'm grateful that I had a guide and mentor in that, who was my big sister, who had a little, almost 10 years on me, and was the first one to really talk with me about the importance of religion, the importance of listening to other religions and their wisdom, the importance of thinking through our faith in imaginative and creative ways, and also listening to people with perspectives different than our own or those we might have been brought up with. My sister came of age in the 70s, she was inspired by people like Woodward and Bernstein who did investi investigative journalism. And my brother, sister, and I were all inspired by a dynamic journalism teacher who inspired many of our peers. 
My sister's the one of us who became a journalist and editor, uh, continued to do investigations and looking at the deep meaning of things. In my mind, she's, she lives the closest to her values as most anyone I know. She is consistently kind, responsible, and ethical. She's now an environmental activist. She was early in the feminist and non-nuclear movements. And recently, in the last few years, she embarked on an adventure of faith, which she didn't expect, she didn't want. It was becoming a companion with someone who is a registered sex offender in prison, someone she regularly visited and became a minister to in many ways for someone whose crime many consider unforgivable. And she's here to share that story with us. I have to warn you that although she doesn't go into any of the crimes that this person committed, this may not be suitable for some of our younger parishioners, but I would invite families to think about this and how they might discuss this issue or issues around forgiveness going forward. To guide us, I'd like to just turn to the Gospel of John, another scripture passage. We might add that which we just heard from Matthew. There's just been a debate about whether Jesus should be tried for blasphemy by claiming his nature as a, child, as a son of God. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was eventually left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. The good news of Jesus Christ. With these words of forgiveness, I turn it over now to my friend, my mentor, my big sister, Kimberly French. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me into your sacred space and time together this morning. Today, I want to talk about something that is really hard. How do we as individuals, as communities, as a whole society treat people who have committed crimes that seem unforgivable? I got thrown into this moral dilemma several years ago. Someone I'd gotten to know and really like a lot, the partner of an old friend, disclosed to me that he had served a sentence for sexually abusing children two decades before. I felt like the floor had dropped out from underneath me. I didn't know if we could still be friends. It challenged the very core of my beliefs. In Unitarian Universalism, our first principle is we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Other people of faith may say that everyone is worthy of being forgiven or redeemed. Did I truly believe what I said? I'm a journalist, so I started researching, and many of my assumptions about the people who commit these crimes and why and under what circumstances were turned upside down. 
I wrote about all this in an essay called Offenders Among Us in the UU World. You can find it online. But today I want to talk about what happened after that essay, my spiritual adventure. And before I go any further, I just want to assure you, I won't be going into the details of the crimes of the ex-offenders I've gotten to know, but I will be talking about the people they are now. So a while back, I got an email from Kathy Williams. Kathy is a paralegal who works with incarcerated sex offenders at the Massachusetts Treatment Center in Bridgewater, which is just a few miles from my house. I think of her as the Sister Helen Prejean for this population of inmates. She attends a nearby UCC church. She calls herself a Jesus lover, and she's always trying to recruit ministers and lay people to come visit her clients, who she calls her guys. Most ministers don't even return her calls. I told her no, too. I worried about being manipulated and whether I might put my family in danger. She really intrigued me, so I said, let's meet for coffee. Have you ever been inside a prison, she asked me. I told her, no, you need to do that. Every American should. Most of her guys are old, she told me. They've served their time for what they did, and they've undergone treatment, but they are still in prison under what our state calls civil commitment until psychologists or jury trials determine that they can be released. Kathy believes that few, if any, are a danger to anyone. Many of their families have disowned them or died off. One man had not had a visitor in 45 years. I see this as God's work, she told me. If Jesus came back today, I believe the first place he'd go would be the Massachusetts Treatment Center. All you need is a listening ear and an open heart. Just be someone who sees their humanity. Her language and her passionate faith struck a deep chord in me. I said, okay. She had a guy in mind for me. I'll call him David. He grew up Catholic. He promised he'd go to mass with his 80-year-old mother if he ever got out. But he's spiritually confused, Kathy told me. Oh, so that's why you thought he'd be a good match for a Unitarian Universalist, I laughed. Yes, she shot right back. I don't get you Unitarians. The first time I visited David was right before Passover and Easter. The prison doesn't make it easy. There are pages of rules about clothes. No layers, no sandals, no boots after April 15th. No jeans, no lace, no leggings, no jewelry, and no sleeveless summer dresses. I've been turned away several times. And there's always changing information about when the guard is on duty to check you in and search you, when you can enter the trap where you're locked in on both sides, which leads into the visiting room with lots and lots of waiting at each step. Right away, I got a taste, tiny taste, of what it felt like to be controlled by an institution. I was nervous. I had no idea how we'd get a conversation going. When I first saw David, he got teary. Then we we just started talking. Kathy had been right. I mostly listened about his family, what life in prison was like. We talked about music and food, the meals he wanted to make for his mother when he got out, comparing our favorite ways to make pie crust. And he told me about the inspirational carvings he made as gifts out of the tiny prison issue soap bars that he got and how upset he was when he was disciplined for that. After several visits, he asked me, do you know what I did? And I had to confess, yes, I looked up the newspaper stories after I learned your name and they were really bad. He began to share more about his treatment, what he was learning about what he had to do to stay safe, his shame, his remorse about the harm he'd caused, and how he hoped that maybe someday he'd be able to do something good in some way, somehow, maybe helping other ex-offenders stay safe. It wasn't always easy to hear. When he went before the psychological examiner, a note was made in his case that he had been able to maintain a relationship with a member of the community. He wrote this in his journal. I became emotional at our first meeting 
because I couldn't comprehend the kindness and generosity of someone who would take time out of their busy day to go visit a repeat sex offender in prison. The changes I've been making make me realize that I spend my life talking the talk. And here was a woman walking the walk. Surrounding myself with positive-minded, spiritually-based people will be the cornerstone of my recovery. I'm so fortunate to have these people put into my path. I think I'm better equipped to recognize healthy versus unhealthy relationships. I found myself changed too. I was filled with gratitude for my freedoms and all I have, and also humility about how little I knew about prison and the whole criminal justice system. When I sit waiting in silence behind several sets of locked doors, I often feel more truly present than when I'm in church or meditating. Over and over, I'm struck. It's so obvious from how David lights up every time he sees I come to visit by how much this small act of compassion, just affirming someone's humanity, could mean to another human being. Before my spiritual adventure, I could have used the word monster or heard it to describe the ex-offenders I know now and not even flinched. It's easy to think that everyone who commits or is convicted of these kinds of crimes is a predator. But studies have shown that chronic adult molesters, the Jerry Sanduskies of the world, represent a small number of sex offenders, less than 5%. There are a whole range of crimes and circumstances. The majority of those who are incarcerated, serve their time and undergo treatment can live safe lives. Still, I want to be clear here. Because we have faith and compassion doesn't mean that we still don't set boundaries, that we aren't always watchful, and that we're, or that we're saying that survivors have to forgive. I'm not saying that at all. There are some people who cannot be alone with or around children ever. In fact, I've seen both my friend and David, who's now out living in the community and doing well impose that safeguard on themselves. And that's one reason why having adult relationships with people they can be honest with and who will hold them, hold them accountable is so critical in keeping us all safe. It may be impossible to believe in the worth and dignity of people who have done heinous things. I've come to think that aspiring to believe in people's worth may serve better as a commandment for me and my own moral behavior to keep me from becoming a monster when I see evil in others. So why do I visit a sex offender? There's so much brokenness in this world, so many other needs in our communities right now. Why not choose another place to serve? I get that. This is not something everybody will be called to do or able to do or even maybe hear about. Since the mid-aughts, state legislatures around our country have passed hundreds of sex offenders laws that increase incarceration and restrict the rights of ex-convicts, keeping them away from schools, parks, and all sorts of other places. In 2012, a national sex offender registry went into effect. These laws, however, have had many unintended consequences, which may have made us less safe. In some communities, there is virtually nowhere a registered sex offender can live and rejoin their family. The public perception is that here are the people we have to worry about. It's sanctioned a sort of hysteria where it's okay for TV reporters or citizens to sound the alarm Anytime an ex-con on the registry does anything other than hide in their house. The biggest risk to our children comes not from strangers, not even from registered sex offenders like David or my friend who admit their crimes and want to be in relationship with us. This is a crime that goes 90% unreported. The biggest risk is from people we likely already know and like and trust who keep their crime secret. 
uncles, cousins, boyfriends, teachers, coaches, ministers, other children and teens. No one would say there is zero risk from the people on the registry, but they are the ones who have admitted guilt, often for crimes committed when they were quite young, served a sentence, in many cases undergone extensive treatment and evaluations and passed some hurdles, many hurdles, showing they're committed to, to serving a safe life. And like all ex-cons, maybe more so, what they need in order to keep that commitment is three things, stable housing, a job, and healthy adult relationships that they are accountable to. As a society, we strike out on all three. We could not make it harder for them. Being one of those adults whom ex-offenders can be honest with was something I decided I could do. Here was another factor in why I said yes. This hellhole, and you may have heard about it in the news, it was a COVID hotspot in our state. And the second inmate I've been visiting has been in lockdown in a tiny cell since March. This hellhole is a couple miles from my house. I drive around it all the time. Over my life, I've come to believe that however I am called to serve my community, it needs to be not just about giving money, but hands-on, local, in partnership with others. I need to be invited and not just come up with what I think is a solution. I need to be open to being changed and seeing how I may even be part of the problem. And I need to listen. And here was Kathy Williams inviting me to come and just listen to the most forgotten, hated people who much of our society is happy to let rot a few miles down the road from my house. Here was my call. How could I say no? Faith sometimes asks us to hold things that do not want to be held in the same place. Love and fear, compassion and rage, an open door that welcomes all, and a sanctuary that is safe for those who come inside. Empathy for men struggling to live safe lives, and utter heartbreak for traumatized survivors. The message I take away from my adventure is this. We can't just keep driving around this problem or staying silent. When we give in to our horror and our vitriol, when we see only monsters, we are actually part of this problem. That response is an obstacle in keeping ourselves and our children safe. And for me, in grappling with my faith at one of its hardest places. Think back to Jesus' words. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison. I believe each of us needs to examine our hearts. Do we really believe in the worth and dignity, in the possibility of forgiveness and redemption for every person, whatever they've done, whatever condition we find them in? And if you believe that, what does that call you to do? Blessed be, and thank you again for listening to my story. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace in the 1770s, was a British slave trader who denounced his faith. One captain called him the most profane man he'd ever met. Newton was also abused as a young man and even enslaved himself. After his slave ship and his life were spared in a storm, he had a spiritual conversion, and he later became a minister and an abolitionist. This morning, I invite us to sing Amazing Grace with the comforting knowledge that none of us can be summed up by our worst act, and that all of us are worthy of dignity and forgiveness. Singing.
in songs was mother's joy as the shadows gather at the close of day and I'd sit upon her knee in those days that used to be as she Please join me in the prayers of the people as we offer our petitions and praises to God. O God, who is with us in our hope and our despair, in our triumphs and our failures, in our moments of insight and in our deepest confusion, who knows our kindnesses and our failures to be kind. God of each human being, and of the great and incomprehensible creation, 
we offer our prayers to you today. We pray for the United Parish community, for Betty, grant her comfort and recovery, for Bertha and Bill and David helping them, for a member having surgery, for my mother-in-law, Gloria, in the hospital, and our family as we seek how best to care for her, for a new pregnancy in our midst. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those just beyond our church walls, for all the struggling businesses in our Coolidge Corner community and those left unemployed by those struggles, for all our teachers and students starting a complicated new year of school, for inspiring us with all the ways that United Parish can best support our community. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the wider world, for those endangered by the fires in California and Arizona and across the too dry far west of our nation, and for those who battle those fires. For those killed and left homeless or without power or water by Hurricane Laura, and for those still in the storm's path in the too wet Midwest of our nation. For Jacob Blake and the protesters killed in Kenosha, and for the safety of all protesters who advocate for justice. For a safe voting process this week and the encouragement of the right and duty to vote for all people of this nation. For all those suffering in this global pandemic, we pray that it may be a force that reminds us of our shared humanity, even as we have to stay physically further apart. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray these things and one thing more, as Jesus taught us, we now pray. Our creator in heaven, hallowed be thy, your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Deborah Hall, and United Parish has been my church home for the past 26 years. My husband, David Rockwell, and I came here as young parents and raised our children, Hannah and Henry, in this church family. And now we're about to be retirees. Over the years, I've participated in many ministry teams, and what I love about this church is anything I dive into ends up enriching me 10 times more than I could have imagined, and I love collaborating with the people at United Parish. And this summer has been no different. The sacred strolls have been a great blessing to me. I'm currently the co-convener of the Adult Deepening Ministry Team. Our approach to adult programming at United Parish is very adaptable. We have at the core the wonderful, vibrant, long-standing um, adult Bible study uh, that's available on a drop-in basis to everyone. And we do seasonal events um, related to Advent and Lent. And then we do pretty much anything else that people want, um, book studies, um, more in-depth Bible studies, spiritual practices, and other um, book groups and such. But as the COVID pandemic began during Lent, we learned quickly that we needed to be adaptable and flexible and moved the Bible study and the Lenten groups to the Zoom platform, which has worked pretty well um, given all the circumstances. But this summer, as the weather got nice, I was yearning for an opportunity to do something outside with people in real time. And so we originated the idea of the sacred stroll. Working with the COVID safe guidelines that were put together by the facilities and gathering teams, we figured out a way to gather people every week for the last six weeks um, to take time outdoors in beautiful natural places, to be together, to walk, experience scripture, pray together, and it's been wonderful. We started on 4th of July with um, a sacred stroll in the Forest Hills Cemetery, which is so rich with history. Um, and we read together the Frederick Douglass speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. It was a very moving experience. And then we moved on to Griggs Park and a visit to Halls Pond Sanctuary, um, where the shrams are very active. Um, and then we went to the Riverway to see the art exhibit. And um, every, every experience was wonderful and different people came. And when we went to the Arboretum, we had a large group from JP um, where we have a lot of members um, living. So organizing and enjoying these sacred strolls has been a great blessing for me this summer. Seeing some of our fam UP family together, not just on Zoom, but in, in uh, person grounded me in this crazy pandemic time. It's been a blessing to be together and it's a blessing to find these beautiful places within three miles of our church home that we can enjoy together. So if you're a first time visitor to this online worship, your presence is gift enough. But if you regularly attend our on online worship, we invite you to contribute generously to the work of United Parish. You can do that by contributing online at the um, web address noted here, or you can send a check to United Parish at 210 Harvard Street. Thank you very much for your gifts. Your gifts help us all take part in these wonderful activities at United Parish. Thank you.
Let us pray. Loving God, with the dynamism of your Holy Spirit moving around us and within us, as close to us as breath and as powerful as the strongest wind at sea, we give thanks for your life-giving strength and all the ways you sustain each of us with food, shelter, friends, family, this congregation, and our very breath and being. We ask your blessings on these gifts that we now receive, and with your guidance, we will use them in holy ways. Fitting your vision of bringing your kingdom here on earth, just as it is in heaven. And let the people say, Amen. I want to thank you for joining us in worship today and for all our participants, including my sister, all our musicians who put together great music for us. Uh, also, if you enjoyed today's worship, I want to invite you to share it with your friends. Let them know. Send them a link. Be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page. That's how we share the good news of what our congregation is about here. 
Uh, I invite you to join us next week when we'll hear the last of our 11-part series of Adventures in Faith and hear from a member, Cindy Vreeland, as she will talk about her important work helping people get out of sex trafficking using her legal ability to help there. I want to invite you to stay for Zoom coffee hour directly after this. The link is in your weekly email. Um, also, uh, to let you know that this afternoon at 4.30, we're going to have a sacred stroll in Lars Anderson Park from 4.30 to 6. It's a way to connect spiritually and socially with folks. We've had a lot of fun with these. We're going to meet at the uh, domed cupola by the pond there. And if you want to bring a picnic and stay to have a picnic on the lawn, some people may want to do that and share a little time of fellowship there. Um, also to let you know that this Thursday, September 3rd, we're going to try some worship on the lawn safely distanced, masked at 6.30, kind of 30-minute evening prayers there. And also next Sunday, September 6th, we're going to try a hike in the Blue Hills for a prayer and worship hike. So if you'd like to do a little extra hiking, you can join us for that. Reminder that we have Tuesday evening prayers for 15 minutes, 15 minutes apiece on Zoom, and a Wednesday morning meditation for 30 minutes at 8 a.m., all good stuff, ways for us to connect. For those of you with uh, children, uh, we do have a church school program that's going to happen both in person and virtually. Um, and there's registration information that went out this week. If you didn't get it, please let us know. And on uh, two Sundays from today, on the 13th, we begin our kickoff again. We'll start worship at 11 a.m., uh, our regular time, and we'll resume Bible study then as well. For now, we have some other important holy business we need to do. And so I'm going to invite our Minister of Music, Susan DeSelms, our assistant music director, Joseph Fat Contreras, and also our member, Dave Hepner, to join me here for a special blessing. One of the bittersweet things about doing ministry and having church in a culture where we have lots of cool people in their 20s and 30s is that many of them are just figuring out the next steps in their work and professional lives, and sometimes that takes them away from us. And so that is the case with these two remarkable people that Susan have with us here. Uh, Dave Hepner, who's been a member, officially a member now for three years, I believe, United Parish. And our assistant music director, Joseph Fat Contreras, whom you all got a letter from this week, who is starting a graduate program this fall at New England Conservatory of Music. And I first wanted to say something about Dave, which is when he first came to us, he was very clear that he had gotten burned out at his last church and serving on committees and boards, and he didn't want to do that anymore. And we have tried very carefully to respect that, but that did not stop him from becoming a vibrant part of our ministry, singing in the chancel choir, playing piano in summer worship, uh, leading us when Susan was away, and even being cajoled into mowing the front lawn and uh, using the snowblower since he had the good fortune to live directly across the street from the church. Um, and we are grateful. And if you've ever had a conversation with Dave, you know that he's a quiet, soulful presence. And when you start talking, there are just wonders of information and thoughtfulness going on. Uh, with this guy. He ha has left us to, or is leaving us, he's in his lab at the University at Buffalo in New York, where he has started a new uh, assistant or associate professorship. Assistant, yeah. Assistant professorship in chemistry. He is still going to be doing some work with Dana Farber, and so we, we will still be able to see him from time to time, and in this online atmosphere, we are all still very connected. And Susan, could you just say a few things about our dear Josephat. Well, it is a bittersweet moment um, to say farewell in this way to Josephat because we all know we have his, his glorious voice has blessed us many times, and we are very proud to see him go on and, and learn and become the singer that he needs to be and should be for this world to have. But he's also been an incredibly joyful and warm and loving and supportive and kind and helpful and thoughtful and just genuine presence in on the staff and uh he's been terrific with our kids and has developed real relationships with them i have heard you know at least in my household that you know that uh, he's just endeared himself to the to, to the kids and that is not easy <laughs> all the time and we and so anyway it's I get tongue-tied at this point because I, I, I truly do mean it. Um, 
we are we are really gonna miss you. Um, you have, have brought so much love to our to our to our community, um, and and it's 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 not gonna be the same having uh, you not here. So we wish you the absolute best. And the choir, I believe, has started a love offering for Joseph Fat. Uh, to help him with uh, expenses for his studies this fall. And if any of you would like to contribute to that, you can let Susan know. Uh, Susan at upbrookline.org or contact us in the office. We welcome sharing with our love to help him with books and other necessities and scores and music that he needs this fall as he starts school. I want to invite you, and I will just echo what Susan said. Um, Joe's Fetch is all love and friendship, and we have, in, in with beautiful music, and we have so been blessed by that. I invite you all to warm up your blessing hands, uh, as we often do. Normally, we would do this in the center aisle right here in the sanctuary, and extend them out. It feels a little weird, I know, to do it to your screen, but it's all good. Um, and just join me in a blessing um, for these guys. You can bless yourselves, or you can bless, uh, how are you, yeah, how are you want to do it? Um, <laughs> Join me in this blessing. Dear God, we give thanks for Dave and Josephat, for the ways that they have blessed us with their presence, with their ministry among us in music making, in choir directing, in lawn mowing, and snow blowing, and singing and playing. Bless them on their way as they begin new endeavors in teaching and in education, that they may grow in wisdom and knowledge, that they may make new friends who will be significant parts of their lives, knowing that they still have connections to us here at United Parish, that we are all joined in one spirit, in one eternal song that resounds throughout the universe. Thank you, God, for this time we have shared together. Be with us as we go forward in faith. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, be with all of us this day and evermore. And let the people say, Amen.